Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event, Social Justice Unlocked, Activating Your Allyship. My name is Jimmy Ko, and I am the Vice Chair of Programming for the Young Alumni Council. And for those that are unfamiliar, the Young Alumni is the specific group of USC alumni under the age of 35. And this does not mean you have to be under 35 to attend or participate in our events. Um, everybody is welcome. It just means that our events are going to be a little bit more catered towards individuals under the age of 35. And for this event, um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today, Brianna Wallace and Autumn Gupta. Um, we have two alums here who founded Justice in June, uh, back last June, which, um, and this is a social justice platform. So Brianna and Autumn met as freshmen at the University of Southern California in 2015. Brianna graduated in 2019 with a BS in Business Administration, um, emphasizing entrepreneurship and minored in dance. She now works in the beauty industry as a brand manager. And Autumn graduated this past May with two degrees in uh, geo design and also environmental studies. And she will be, um, she's a eighth grade science teacher, sorry. And she plans to, pursue a full-time career in geospatial mapping. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and just pass it on and have them share more of their story. All right. Hi, everyone. We are super pumped to dive in today. So first off, we want to say thank you for having us and also on behalf of the Young Alumni Council. And we want this to be interactive. So we have popped in a link in the chat and then you'll also see the code on the screen. And this is for you to interact with our first little just pulse check that we will be going to here soon. We also want you to throw in any questions, comments, you can do so in the Q&A section as well as the chat. So as we go along, please feel free to pop anything in. We'll have a midway pause to just open it up five to seven minutes for Q&A before we transition to the workshop session. So we will have some time and then we'll have some time at the end, but we want to be able to engage with you all. So please, I see lots of you joining in. And if you have any questions, just shoot us a message. Also, it will, when you go to joinpd.com, we do recommend you can do this on a phone, a tablet, a secondary laptop, whatever floats your boat. Um, as you can tell, I am an eighth grade science teacher. So I'm utilizing one of the things that I used during remote learning a lot to engage my students. And so uh, you will need a Gmail. It'll ask you to log in with a Gmail. Your uh, answers and your engagement with it are 100% uh, anonymous on this. I would have to take a lot of extra steps to figure out who specified what answer. So please do not stress about that, but just a fun new piece of technology to explore. And we'll give about five more seconds for people to hop on. As Bree said, you can always access that link. And Bree, do you want to send that one more time in the chat? Yes. Just in case. And we'll get started. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go forward. All right, so again, the Pear Deck is a little more uh, interaction, gets you, gets some audience participation. So you can use your cursor, you can use your touch screen, whatever you prefer, but give us a little bit of a temperature check, a pulse check on how comfortable you feel currently with activating your allyship. Um, so just give us an indication there. And the cool thing with Pear Deck I will show you right now so you can see kind of everyone's answers, but I like to overlay them. And this gives me a good feeling of, okay, cool. We got a lot of people that are over on the green side. We love that. We also got people generally in the middle, which is completely okay. We got some people on the far end. That's, that's why you're here. That's why you're participating in this session. So there's absolutely no shame with wherever you're falling on this comfort level. Um, but we like to know for ourselves so we can make sure to tailor this more to your experience or know that we have people who are already in the space, already trying to work along their journey, and we'll try to um, address that. So thank you. Thank you again for submitting all those answers. Awesome. So today we'll be going through a lot. Um, first up, we're going to share a little bit about us, our story and who we are. Also, how our how our Trojan story played out, as well as the inception of Justice in June. What got us here? How have we developed thus far? And then we're going to just lay the foundation. So we're going to give you tangible foundations of allyship. Some things that we have found helpful in reframing how you look at this journey and how you can apply this to several different 
different spheres. And then we'll take a pause and then dive into build your own toolkit. So we will give you a step-by-step -step breakdown of how you can go and build your own toolkit that can help you dive into deeper learning. Awesome. All right, so this is something we haven't gotten to speak about as much, and we were like, oh my gosh, we're with the Trojan fam, we're kicking off the first day of USC's DE&I week, so we wanted to tell you and show you our cringy pictures from six years ago when we actually became friends. So Bree, I don't know if anyone here in the audience remembers when they had to sign up for roommate, but Bree's going to kind of start it and all. Yes. So I am from Southern California from in Orange County and Autumn is all the way from Missouri. So two different lifestyles and we got randomly paired as freshman roommates through the USC res portal. And this is the top left corner is our second apartment that we had at Troy Hall. So if anyone is newer and still remembers Troy Hall, um, that's where we were. We've been through game days, graduation, all of the things and Autumn and I just started as we together in 2015. I studied business administration, dance minor, entrepreneurship emphasis. So I was doing everything that I wanted to pursue. And what we found was the dynamic of our relationship really was built upon being able to be our most authentic self, as well as to share all the things from the quirky things we loved, the obsession with Grey's Anatomy, to <laughs> going to game days and to looking at the world from our view and our perspective and how we could change the little microcosm of our world and be able to make an impact on the larger scale. Yes. And what Brie failed to mention is that I had a lot of misgivings about our initial pairing. So today, obviously, we're very bubbly. We're very close. We are best friends. And I use that label genuinely. But when I initially got my like randomly paired roommate request back, like, hey, this is who you were actually living with for an entire year when you first come to campus. Her username was at Pink Sparkle Brie, and I grew up on a farm. I'm very much a tomboy. I was like, oh, my word. Her username is Pink Sparkle Brie, and I was very <laughs> concerned. And then, you know, you look through people's social media. So I'm giving you this whole preface to say that we were unlikely best friends, um, and that's going to be relevant a little bit later on when we talk about having unlikely conversations with people you would never think you could relate to. So that's why I'm giving you this little backstory. So that was the first red flag, Pink Sparkle Brie. I was like, oh, my gosh a girly girl, like, can I do this? And then I was like, it's fine, give her a chance. So I looked her up on social medias. This girl had no Facebook, which I thought was very weird. This is pre-Instagram really taking off. So it was weird if you were our age and didn't have a Facebook, but she did have an Instagram. And instead of have, this was before they allowed you to do the horizontal carousel as well, where you could slide through multiple photos. So Brie had collages. And I remember overwhelmingly there being a lot of collages. She begs to differ. And then the thing that we did bond on though, was I asked, okay, what's the TV show you're into? I'm gonna watch it so I, we can bond over one thing. And now she mentioned it was Grey's Anatomy. So in three weeks in July, I binged all 11 seasons at the time. So we could relate. And obviously we hit it off. We are, we are best friends to this day. We room together again in that apartment. We even, this picture on the far right is actually part of our audition for a Fear Factor episode, which we were contestants on. So our friendship has really blossomed and led us to here today which also is a big part of our story. Right. So I'll hand it back to you. So the inception of Justice, June, Justice in June really started obviously back in June and it was catalyzed by the murder of George Floyd. So as you know, with a lot of the social justice absurgence that we've seen, that was a really big indicator. And for me, it hit differently. I had been used to being super desensitized. You know, I had things to had a life to live. I couldn't always emotionally tune into everything that was going on. But for eight minutes and 46 seconds, a lot of us got to see a man's life extinguish. And so I shared on my social media, which Autumn was not on at the time, how it impacted me. And so whether someone was following me because they loved me, cared about me, respected me, admired me, this was a way that they could see here's someone and the tangible effect it's having on their life. So I shared it with my parents and I shared it with Autumn. And she said, you know, I just want to talk and break this down. I may not be able to fully understand, but I can sit with you in that dark place and I can listen and I can also figure out how I can be better and what more I can do as a friend, but also as an ally. Yeah, and I wanted to speak to that a little further because um, I remember Bree sent me this video, so I was not on Instagram at the time. I was taking a hiatus, 
And so she sends me this video that she's posted in response. And of course I'd seen the news. So I was aware of kind of the, the context around it, but at the very end, and I will, I will probably never forget this for the rest of my life. She poses this question and says, if I was the one who was died, how would your life be any different? Would you be doing like, what would you be doing today that you wouldn't necessarily be doing if it, if you didn't know me, if I wasn't that one who was gone. And that was super convicting for me because I was like, oh my gosh, my life would be completely different. Like, this is my best friend. We gave you all these weird backstory details about why we are such close friends. And I would 100% be doing something different. I'd be speaking out, I'd be showing up and I would be taking action because this beautiful soul had just been lost from our society. And from there, I also realized another moment of conviction was that myself as a woman of color, not part of the black community, but as a woman of color who was educated at our fabulous alma mater, um, I didn't know 75% of the black scholars, authors, activists, whose voices were being shared, whose uh, work were being aggregated on lists of how can you be an ally and how can you become a part of this solution I wasn't familiar with. And that was kind of a wake up call for me as well. Like, okay, I am an action oriented person. I like to have a plan, very type A, love my color coding. And so that ultimately, after Brie and I had this two and a half hour call, um, this ultimately became a Google doc called Justice in June, where as I was building out, I basically just wanted to make a plan for June. Uh, because George Floyd's murder happened at the end of May. So I was like, okay, I'm going to dedicate one entire month to just trying to understand all of these voices I'm hearing, all of this context around it, and these events that I wasn't familiar with beforehand. And so I took several of the aggregated lists and I just started putting resources, whether those were podcasts, articles, YouTube videos, uh, TED Talks, whatever they were, put them into a 30-day template of how I could pick one thing to tackle and dive into each day. And then ultimately that kind of became, I was like, oh, okay, we have 10 minutes option, a 25 minute option, a 45 minute option, because I had friends who had also reached out or who I wanted to be my accountability partners. And Brie, being the loving, gracious friend that she is, agreed to give her insight and her lens to look over this document because I didn't want, again, I wanted to be part of the solution. I didn't want to contribute to a problem that our society has been festering. And I was like, okay, these are the voices I'm seeing shared, but does this align with the movement or with your insight as someone who is a part of the black community? And so she was an active part in creating this and giving me different references and giving me her insights on how I could tweak a couple of things so they did align with Black Lives Matter and with the social justice movement as a whole. And from here, Brie, you wanna describe a little bit of what, what happened? <laughs> So from there, we posted, I posted to my social media predominantly and Autumn shared on her Facebook and really for us, for Autumn was a way for her to do the learning alongside others who maybe had a similar or even more, I would say somewhat stunted background, right? So her family, her friends, right, that she grew up with. Um, and for me, it was a way to direct people as a starting place. I had a lot of conversations and, and questions around how can I be better? What can I do? Where do I start? Right. When there was a lot of that information out there, but what we saw was that there was so much being offered. Here's 20 different books you can read. Here's all the different articles. This is who you should be listening to. And for a lot of people that was paralyzing, it was overwhelming and it stopped people from actually getting into the position of doing that unlearning and relearning and then going forth and acting on that. So this was designed as a starting place. And first night we posted it, we got like 31 retweets because we both neither had Twitter. And so we're like, okay, let's make a joint one. And we shared it on there. And then from there, it uh, went, it blew up. It went viral. We had a few people that were in our circles that had larger followings that reshared and reposted. A few weeks later, the Washington Post reached out to us and shared our story on Juneteenth as well as our resource. And from there, we just sped up. So we, we took this document, which was being overloaded with a lot of traction. We had had over 200,000 people in the first week alone that were accessing it and over 1.1 million impressions on Twitter in just the first seven days. And so we're like, okay, well, we don't want access to be a reason why someone can't start and do the learning. And so from there, we made very quickly a website, which is justiceinjune.org, where we refresh the content a bit. We put out each of the breakdowns. So we did it based 10 minutes, 25 minutes, 45 minutes. So 
you could incorporate it into your existing lifestyle, right? If you only have 10 minutes in the morning while you're drinking your coffee, here's a plan for you. If you have 45 minutes that you can incorporate into your day, this is a more robust plan. And from there, we just took it by storm. So we wanted to make sure that, okay, people really wanted this. This was a testament to what people needed. We wanted to continue to build out tools and resources, as well as use our voices to advocate on behalf of others. So in June, we had Justice in June. In July, we did an entire new month of content. Justice in July, we partnered with an app called Snap Habit. So we took a more modular approach. Each week, we broke down the content and centered it around a question. In August, we did a book club. So we opened it up to the public and we made it so that we could create tangible tools to approach more substantial material, right? So instead of just, here's an article, here's a TED talk, right? Here's a whole novel that you can read and how do you actually go through and digest so you're not just consuming at face value, but you're really digging into the nuance of it and how that applies to your life. And then from then on, we've had speaking engagement, we've speak we've spoken to corporations, organizations, and companies and teams and be able in spaces just like this to share our journey, what we have found really helpful and continuing to break this down and going from there. And so now we're here, we get to keep using our voice, we plan to build out a more robust version of our website and keep building tools and resources so that we can take this moment to a movement. Yes. All right, so now we want to dive into, we have a couple, so things that have been really cool about what Justice in June was and what it's become is first, we've been able to learn from, we like to call ourselves regular folks, so we've been able to learn from other everyday people on how they're receiving certain things, how they're interpreting certain things, and what is most useful for them in their allyship journey, or just even as like small, every, like, we call them just these tools in your toolkit, things you can actively use to communicate and connect with other humans who may be on the fence or who may be polar opposite of what you believe. So before we kind of dive into, we have three specific things where we want to share with you on that, uh, that we have gotten a lot of feedback on and definitely resonate with most groups. We want to just start with some shared vocabulary because we all need to be on the same page about what we really mean when we're saying active anti-racist allyship. Yes. So first of active, this is that continual progression, ongoing improvement. So every day may not look the same, right? The rate at which you're learning and learning and you're acting, it might not be the same every single day, but the goal is to make sure they are always moving forward, that it's a constant progression. That rate may change, but that trend line should be getting increasingly better, right? It should be active and ongoing. And that second piece, the anti-racist, this for me was a bit of personal ignorance and naivete around it's not enough to be not racist. If you want to be part of the solution, you have to be in the game. You cannot sit on the sidelines and think that you are anti-racist. That is an ongoing, again, ongoing, a state, a, a perspective, a thing you bring with you. Um, it's not just a label that you can be like, oh, yes, of course, now I am anti-racist. It's like a goal that we are all striving towards. Right. And then allyship, right? Speaking up, speaking out, standing with. This is where you incorporate solidarity, where maybe you don't 100% understand where someone's coming from, but you're going to choose to listen to honor and to respect that lived experience and that identity and understand that lived experiences aren't mutually exclusive. What is exclusive? What is true for you? It, the truth for someone else is just as true, right? Perception is reality and all of our perceptions are different. So allyship is really standing alongside and eventually moving to a place where you can be an advocate on behalf of others. And you can make sure that you're amplifying the voices in this space that are doing the work and have been doing it for a long time. And another note with this is later, the last kind of third of our session tonight, we saved to, to truly be a workshop where we are working with you on creating that plan. But allyship is not mutually exclusive to just the racial justice movement. So you can think about allyship as whatever identity you hold or an identity that you personally don't hold, but you know that you don't know enough about that community. It's showing up for all of those, for anyone that's marginalized or oppressed, not just one specific facet of it. So keep that in mind too, as we go forward, we're not just referring to the racial justice movement when we refer to active anti-racist allyship. Right. So we want to have some shared vocab just to start off and then going into our first tool here, Bree is going to walk us through it. But finding your lane has been sometimes what we've realized is just having language to explain like what is what is working for you, what's not working has been really empowerful, empowerful, goodness, really empowering for lots of different folks. So we want to walk you. This is the first kind of tool in your toolkit is this idea of finding your lane. 
Yes. So really to paint the picture, right? No two people's allyship journey can or will look the same, right? It depends on where do your talent, your resources, right? Your abilities are able to meet an opportunity to uplift and further this journey. So we all might be in different lanes, but the point is that we're on the same road, working towards the same end goal that ultimately we never really reach. We're always pushing progress forward. And there's many different ways that you can do this. So a few to name is monetary donations, right? Also donating your time, your money, right? Wherever you can maybe um, input a cause that you care about, an organization that could use help. There's also political engagement, right? Reading up, not just on the federal level, but what is it to vote a yes or no on a certain proposition, right? Who do you have in place at the city and the county and the state level? And what do they stand for? And what does supporting um, different parts of that breakdown look like? There's also protests, right? Um, gatherings and obviously safely because we're in COVID. Uh, using your voice alongside people, right? Showing up and being able to say, this is what I stand for and this is what I'm speaking out against. There's also online petitions. There's so many out there to help rally around someone or a group that needs help. So really do your research, right? On what is standing for, what is signing your name on something, right? Or you just lending your voice to a certain movement mean? as well as having those conversations, sometimes those tough conversations with your friends, with your family, with your coworkers, right? Establishing a new type of rhetoric where you're able to have some of those conversations that may be uncomfortable, but are ultimately gonna lead you to a new territory that is going to better how you can speak around this. And then of course, always the learning, unlearning and relearning. How are you constantly breaking down your own belief systems, right? Your own perceptions and taking into account that there are other ways to be thinking about things and being able to have a constructive dialogue and to always be constantly learning and relearning in the process. Yeah, and just another kind of ending note with this is if you try one of these things, and we are going to encourage you later on again uh, to try some of these lanes, if one isn't rejuvenating you, if you're just feeling more and more drained and used up and worn out at the end of the day, you are in the wrong lane. Uh, so you got to get that blink. I always use this joke, but like, get your blinker on, switch lanes. Don't just give up chugging along behind that tractor trailer for the rest of your life. Like get in a lane where you are um, feeling alive and feeling rejuvenated. You're going hundred miles per hour and it's exciting for you. And as you probably can tell, Brian and I were so fortunate to fall into lanes uh, that very much rejuvenate us and refresh us. So really it's maybe a little selfish of us to want to do these speaking engagements because we are, we get so much out of this and we love getting to share our voices and our perspective with you all, especially with our Trojan fam. So my only caveat with finding your lane would be to encourage you if you are trying one of those methods or trying any of the other methods or lanes and it's not doing it for you, you're just exhausted. And you're like, I don't want to keep going in this lane. Then maybe you need to try something different because it should be rejuvenating and there should be a level of fulfillment that comes from giving a part of yourself or your time or your resources towards the cause. So just keep that in mind and we will push you to try switching out a couple lanes later on. So that's one of our toolkits, uh, our tools in our toolkit. Another one that we found really helpful is that specifically looking at the lane of uh, having a conversation. So we like to call this Allyship 101, just the conversation. And I think everyone should be able to commit to any time they're interacting with other humans that their, their baseline of allyship will be communicating, will be willingness to engage with someone. However, there is an asterisk there because I'm not asking you to give your 100% all in standard every single time you come up across the average Joe. This is, I am speaking from personal experience for this whole section because I am very uh, gung ho and very fiery and like, okay, let's go, let's go to battle. Like I'm ready to help this person learn today. And that ended up really just exhausting me and never like the other person probably didn't really care. It was just like, wow, she was weirdly emotional and wound up that whole time. So I want to take you through four examples of types of people. And I've kind of sorted these out into the worn path, the weedy path, the rocky soil and the good soil. So you can know how much of yourself to give to every person you come into contact with. So here we are agreeing that our baseline allyship is willingness to engage in conversation but we are not giving our 100% effort into each type of soil. 
So for the first one, the worn path, how do you recognize this kind of person? Well, there's some characteristics listed here, apathy, indifference, their lack of awareness to said topic that you want to bring up, or perhaps the reason you're initially starting this conversation is because they did speak something from ignorance or from um, not knowing about the topic. So you're like, oh, there's just, there, there's a lack of awareness, or they just don't really understand and can't put themselves outside of their own experience. So like Brie mentioned earlier, every person's lived experience, the things you go through every day are valid because that is your experience in this world. But because your experience is valid, that means every other person's is also valid, equally valid. There's no hierarchy of who is more true in what they're experiencing on a day to day. So here it could also be this person is unable to equate their daily walk with somebody else's daily walk and see that those are both true and equal. And here, um, I would just caution too, like when you're getting certain statements back, you're like, oh man, this person just doesn't get it. You might be talking to someone who's a worn path. And so here you can still plant seeds. You can still kind of give them little tidbits, but you don't have to give them your 100% uh, thesis dissertation on this is how you can get active where you are currently at. Another type of person so the worn path is generally nice, like they're not going to be too abrasive or aggressive, but the rocky path, we're getting a little bit, a little bit uh, seedier where it's um, not always as pleasant for you. So how do you recognize this kind of rocky soil person? Well, they will often say their own truth about said topic is more accurate than your said truth or some other persons that you are trying to represent. They also generally are more of the like polarized extreme views of it's all this or it's all of that. There's no gray area. There's no nuance. They have very predefined ideas of what is and what is not. Um, also, they just might not have had, again, this is a similarity, but they might not have had an experience that allows them to take a walk in somebody else's shoes. So you'll see that uh, maybe narrowed scope or narrowed experience come through in the supporting arguments they'll use or in the supporting statements. And finally, body language, there's some percent that a body of communication that's nonverbal. I don't want to quote it because I don't know what percent it is, but a lot of communication does come from body language. So if that person is crossing their arms, their legs are crossed, they're like hunching over, they're not feeling safe either. They're closing down, they're shutting down. And so you can kind of see that eh, maybe I shouldn't give my 100% because they're not even open and they're physically showing me they are not open to receiving that. So still, I want you to still plant the seed. I want you to still engage, but I do not want you to give more than you can emotionally afford to give in that moment or with that person. And then we also have the weedy soil. So how do you recognize this kind of person? This is probably the trickiest because they generally do have an awareness of what's going on. There's something there where they can use the same language as you. They know all the buzzwords. They know the cliches, but... They're like, oh, we need more time. We need more information. We need more of this before we can truly make a determination on said issue. And you're like, that simply does not work when people's lives are at stake or when people's equality is on the line. And they might, again, have some of that cultural or social um, ignorance. They might just not have been able to experience secondhand or walk in somebody else's shoes just with the way they've grown up or who they've been around. And they may also really give you character. Oh. Siri, we don't need you. They may also give you the vibes of like, oh, they think it's fine to be on the sidelines and that they are still part of the solution. Whereas in this game, you have to be in the game to be a part of the solution. If you're on the sidelines, you're not helping, you're part of the problem. And so this is also a type of person I would not recommend giving your above all and your emotional energy into, still plant those seeds. My favorite kinds of conversations are with people who we can deem the good soil because they are open to an ongoing conversation um, where they will ask you follow-up questions that aren't immediately putting you on the defensive or putting them on the offensive. They will reference their own understanding or uh, additionally things that they've tried to look up like, oh, I, I heard this phrase or I saw this in the news and I tried to understand by doing some secondary step. And there is vulnerability. This is like maybe the hardest thing objectively also for Trojans to admit or to have this humility factor, but there is vulnerability in just admitting, I don't know, or I'm not an expert in said area. And also again, body language, very important to pick up those signals. I don't know how much you can see over Zoom because it's probably where a lot of our socialization is happening right now, but open and not crossing their arms, not crossing their legs, leaning forward, engaged, relaxed posture. These are all signs that this person's probably comfortable and willing to keep talking. 
Um, and so this is the person you would want to give that full attention to. And you really, with all of these, just want to think about, can I get a follow-up conversation? So I had to change my strategy because I was very much like, let me give you the whole spiel. Anytime I interacted with someone who even showed a little bit of ignorance or just wasn't seeing things as I saw them. And then I learned, okay, my goal is just to plant the seed and that they feel I'm approachable. So they have questions in the future. If I plant the seed and then they talk to Brianna later and she waters the seed and then somebody else comes into their life and they're like ray of sunshine. Eventually we're creating conditions where that's going to grow and that's going to be fruitful and that's going to blossom. And if they have questions, then I want them to be like, Oh yeah. Autumn didn't make me feel like a terrible person. Didn't unnecessarily guilt or shame me. She just wanted me to acknowledge or recognize like, Hey, this is an issue. And here's how we can be part of the solution or here's how we remain a part of the problem. And that's really my goal now is just planting seeds, not being afraid to use my voice and recognizing what kind of person I'm talking to so that I don't emotionally expend myself by 9 a.m. every single day because I can't. I'm a human, too, and I get tired. And my tank gets full. So that's our second tool for you is just understanding what type of person you're talking to when you do agree to engage in um, conversations with folks you come into contact. Exactly. And it's also important, right, to think about that people's soil, their basis can fluctuate. It can change. And so like Autumn said, it's important to recognize that. Am I able to at least plant a seed in this conversation? Right. And am I able to mark myself as a person who can have a constructive conversation that they feel comfortable enough to potentially come back to, or even for you to check in and say, you know, bring up those points in that conversation again and just always checking in with yourself to see where you're at are you at the place where it's not going to be mentally or emotionally draining for you to engage and so that leads perfectly into our next section and that's compassion fatigue and burnout so all the things we talked about right finding your lane and going through and having the conversation, seeing the different soils, right? That can be very draining. It can really take a toll on where you're at in, in your own journey. So two things we like to highlight, compassion fatigue, right? So that's that indifference to these constant appeals for those who are suffering, right? A more um, nuanced or, or struggling topic, right? As a constant frequency of that. Burnout is how that manifests us. Those states that we can end up in emotionally, physically, mentally, right? That exhaustion, feeling like we're drained because of this prolonged stress, as well as feeling overwhelmed maybe, right? Or that you just can no longer meet those demands. And where it becomes really critical is in the critical zone where these meet. And so this can manifest in different ways for a lot of people. But what's important to figure out is what is maybe that trigger that is getting to you. So ways we can see this play out paralysis, right? Feeling like oh, I just I don't know what to do. I can't do anything anymore. And you stop, right? Grave indifference of I just, you know, I don't care enough anymore. It's kind of apathetic, um, unwillingness to continue acting where maybe you've been doing so much, or maybe you've been in a lane where you don't feel rejuvenated. And so you just stop, right? You don't keep pouring into the same extent, feeling inadequate, like, oh, am I really moving the needle or doing all the work and then seeing an outcome that maybe wasn't the goal that you were working towards, feeling like maybe I should just withdraw. Maybe this isn't my jam. Maybe I really don't have anything to say about it. Let me just take a step back, becoming desensitized, right? Where things that are occurring and take place no longer affect you in the same way. And it's just another, it you almost becomes normalized or that inability to consume any more type of traumatic material. And so realizing what is your trigger and maybe you, this manifests in different ways um, or multiple ways. For me, desensitization really was a big thing. Like I mentioned, where I just, you know, obviously things that took place were hurtful and harmful and saddening, but it gets to a point where do those emotions, are they evoked immediately when you're seeing any of these things, when you're hearing about injustice and watching nothing happen, right? And that inability to consume any more of that material. So I had to figure out, well, what are the ways in which I can get into this critical zone? Where do I feel burnt out? Where do I feel like I have that compassion fatigue? And check myself so I'm having this constant internal dialogue of maybe I need to prioritize my mental wellness. And that doesn't mean I don't keep acting, but maybe I'm able to switch a lane, right? Maybe I'm able to 
to rev down and just say, okay, you know, I, I need to take a pause from social media, right? Or I need to monitor what types of conversations I'm having if I'm constantly having to step into the space of vulnerability. So really just checking in with yourself, figure out what those triggers are that could get you to this critical zone. And also keep in mind, this is a great way to see when it might be happening to someone else. If you're a part of an organization or you're trying to move forward something in your company or in your social group, right? And you're noticing um, maybe a shift in the group demeanor or, or not feeling like you're being able to achieve the goals that you thought could happen in a certain time period, right? This is a great way to figure out what is maybe triggering that for someone else and help to, to tell them, you know, they're not alone and that these are the ways that you can combat it. Yeah. And I would say for me personally, I often find uh, the feelings of inadequacy and probably borderline on paralysis as well, where I'm just like, I, my F, my personal individual efficacy just gets lowered. Where I'm like, how can I reasonably move the needle or nudge it or even twitch it? Because it is, it is a very complicated, complex issue that does require multi-level work by different groups of people and different entities to ultimately get us to a more equitable, fair, just society. But um, when I recognize that, having the language to A, identify like, oh, I'm feeling this way because of X, Y, or Z, that's really freeing to know, ah, oh, this is why, understand where it's coming from. And like Bree said, I love that. I hadn't even thought about how do you support your friends? Because you can't go at this alone. Um, you you got to have the people around you, whether or not they're accountability, whether they're just kind of the shoulder shoulder doing it with you, whether or not they're inspiring you in their action. you got to be able to lift them up as well and recognize, hey, um, like I noticed this or noticed that, like, how can I encourage you better in this space? Or can I invite you into my line, lane, into what I'm doing to overcome this? Because we want to recognize like, hey, you're a human. You are going to experience compassion, fatigue and burnout like that inevitably will happen, let alone trying to do this work during a pandemic year. So there's a lot that's being asked of us and a lot of us that have just been barely maintaining a neutral baseline and now are dealing with the normal life stuff on top of it. But having the language to recognize when you do feel a certain way, coming up with your own strategies of how you can overcome any of these or any of your own unique barriers or burnout forms. Um, Cause I have to have, I have specific things that I know will help get me out of my funk and will get me moving forward again. Cause you don't want to burn out completely where you're never the Phoenix and rise Phoenix and rise from the ashes. We want you all to rise from the ashes of the burnout. So yeah, I would definitely say this is a slide to take time and reflect on later and make sure you know what your type is. And then what are three things you can do to move yourself through that fatigue or through that burnout? Right. And you might not know them right off the bat. So that comes with a grain of salt. It does take time. You might have to figure it out, but you can also steal like an artist and see what others do and just borrow their strategies as well. And Brie and I, just as another caveat, are always open. If you think of something two days from now, two weeks from now, two years from now, we always have an open door and we're happy to work through that or talk through that with you as well. So that kind of segues us into a little bit of Q&A time. We want to give you a break um, just from this and I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen just for the Q&A. So please go ahead and drop those in the, I think there's a specific Q&A feature or in the chat, either one. Um, and after this, we will get into our active workshop part where we're going to have you helping us do some of the work and figure out what is going to be a good strategy for you. But before we get to that, we would love to just have a conversation. It could be a discussion point. It could be something you want to bring up. It could be a question. Even if you're afraid of asking it bluntly, that's okay. You do not have to be perfectly politically correct. We want to hear it, and we'd love to have a little bit of discussion before we jump into the actual workshop part. Awesome. So we'll give a little bit for you all to drop in any questions. If you don't have any, we will go through, but because this is a 90 minute session, we wanna make sure that we give time, stretch your legs if you need to, get that drink of water. Um, and we just wanna open it up to any questions that we've discussed thus far. We know it's a Monday, so maybe your best was just showing up tonight, which is perfectly okay as well. Or I know that the rest of this week has a lot of other awesome events on the agenda. So if you have questions about those or 
things you can do in advance for some of those events. We honestly, any question is fair game. And I am a teacher. So let me tell you, I fielded my fair number of weird questions. I was like, why on earth would you think about this related to said concept? So please, we love them. We want your questions. Cool. Um, so we have a few coming in. So first up from Jennifer, what kinds of things do you do to get out of a funk? That's a great one. I can start. For me, it's just taking a step back, reminding myself why I'm doing this, and also remembering that I have a privilege to be able to also have access to be able to even use my voice and advocate on behalf of others. And so when I'm able to want to recognize my privileges, right, where I get to excel in certain areas, where I get to speak up for something that I believe in, that is not the case for everyone. So I remind myself of that, but I don't push myself to the expense of where I can't be able to advocate anymore or become such a tiring thing. So luckily Autumn as my best friend is part of the piece that can get me out of the funk and freshman as when we were freshmen, she said, have your pity party, acknowledge your emotions and feelings, do what you need to, and then get back up and keep on grinding. And so I very much it, put that into different aspects of my life but especially now is sometimes I am going to be disheartened sometimes I'm going to feel super frustrated whether it's in the workplace it's you know in life right with friends but that doesn't mean I get to stop because that is a luxury and a privilege that I that others don't get right then and I can't afford to lose so that's how I just step back realign and then jump right back in again yeah. And for me, like, this is a great example because even just this past weekend, I like, I needed to veg and I am very much a person of extreme. So I'm either 100% on the grind, working, feeling every available moment. Like I'm a calendar blocker. So I like, I literally plan every minute of every day, which is maybe a little unhealthy and I'll work on that later. But um, sometimes then I go to the other extreme, which is I can't do anything. Like I am just so exhausted or so numb from doing everything that I do nothing. And so just this past weekend, um, uh, I experienced kind of like one of these, I just need to veg, uh, moments. And like we said, my whole thing is a pity party. So I set parameters on the timing. So I literally time, okay, I'm going to be all my feelings. And anyone who talks to me needs to understand that I'm going to vent or complain or be like, woe is me during this time. And then after that expires, I'm like, okay, get yourself together. We're moving on. Other things that work for me, because I have to literally disrupt my my day to day or or that moment's mindset or activity, um, and it's much harder. I realize now that I can isolate in my room or can't like I'm not required to physically be in person at different things. It's easier for me just to kind of dwell and not um, not address it. So some specific things I do is I have a five minute like song playlist five I think it's actually seven minutes and it they're just such good songs like I can't help but dance to them so physically moving my body helps physically changing my location like just getting out of the bed just putting on fresh clothes just moving out of my bedroom into my kitchen helps because that, that resets my mind enough that I can like okay I did that so now I'm gonna do this so now I'm gonna do this and it's very incremental and then ultimately, I'm very extroverted. I love to be social. So like Bree said, I, if I have a call with someone or if I have a meeting, um, more often than not, my, my brain gets so caught up in getting to hear what's been going on with them or if we're in a meeting like planning or problem solving that I ultimately do feel better afterwards because I've engaged in a process that I genuinely enjoy. So that's problem solving for me. That's talking through verbally processing things. So those are the three things that I tangibly do to, off, to kind of reset or disrupt the funk, but it's hard and it, and it differs for me in, in other seasons too. So but yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, can you share a success story you've had with a rocky soil or weedy soil person? Ooh, I can go first on this one, Bray. So um, generally, and I also want to make sure I like that we can kind of share like things that we have in our life. So I grew up in Smithville, Missouri. That's where I currently live. Um, and as the name would suggest, it is a predominantly white area. Um, and growing up there has given me a lot of insight into kind of the the tendencies, the sentiments of the polarized groups of people we have in our country right now. And because some of my best friends, I am at very different ends of the spectrum, but I still 
can understand why their thinking developed the way it did because I grew up with MK through 12 when I was younger. So uh, two things, and these are actually just shout outs to my mother who is doing her job as a middle-aged white woman to talk to other middle-aged white women um, in her cohort. But one thing she did was she had a, a little wine get together with one friend. She invited them over, they sat you know, distance. And she's like, I just wanna listen to understand. I'm not here to blame you. I'm not here to convince you or persuade you. I realize neither of us are going to persuade the other one, but can we just talk because I trust you and how you perceive the world. And I just want to hear your perspective. Um, and so that was one thing she did where they did just have this conversation. Now we have yet to see, you know, the planting of the seed or the come, the coming back around, but she's left that door open. She hasn't just completely closed in and be like, Oh, deleting from my friend list. Goodbye. Now, as a little nuance to that, I went through a cathartic delete everyone off my friends list who was pissing me off one night and it felt great. I'm not going to tell you, I was like, this is such a good high. I feel so cleansed. And then I realized the next day I was like, oh, no, what are you doing? What if you're the only person who could keep that door open for them? Because you can be the bigger person or you can be objective and level headed enough to say, like, let's come to the middle. Um, and then another example is my mom. Again, it's really it's really awesome to watch your mother kind of step into a space of speaking out and advocating and not just like being quiet or not just like letting other people talk over her. So, wow. Shout out Debbie. Very proud of you. But another time on Facebook, she's been engaging with one particular friend, Facebook friend. And eventually that person did personally message her because she would just comment when this person would post things that she had a fact check or, you know, what have you. And they got to uh, personal messaging or DMing on Facebook messenger and eventually could say like, Hey, I still love and respect your family. I would fight for your family. I'd show up for your family. Cause I'm from a mixed race parent. Um, so we're a mixed family. And my mom was able to say like, yes, I love your sons. Like autumn grew up with them as well. They were in your class. So they were able to understand that even though they had differences, those still came from the same desires of we want our kids to do well. We want uh, to pay our fair share of taxes. We want to live well. We want to pursue our own brand of the American dream. So realizing that it was from similar values and then trying to connect on, hey, we share these values. We share these principles. They're just manifesting in such different ways. Where do we have common ground and what are issues we can work on together with our shared values? And so my mom started approaching it from there of like, think about if this was your family or, hey, you love Autumn. You love Lita, my sister. Um, what if, like, have you ever thought about when they're pulled over by the police, they keep their hands at 10 and 2, they walk their, they walk the policeman through every single action they're doing, um, just because there's a very different experience there. So giving that kind of personal, just flipping of the mirrors, Brie would say, has really helped my mother have conversations with rocky and weedy soil people. Awesome. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful, but it, it does work. Eventually they do come around or you do make micro wins. Right. So we, there's great questions coming in and we will have another Q&A section at the end. So we'll answer maybe two to three more questions and we'll get started back here diving in at six. So um, this is good. Accomplice has re replaced ally in many combos. What are your thoughts in terms for allies? So I think when language begins to shift, it is indicative of the progress that is being made in a certain movement. So I still think both are, are valid. And again, it all depends on this is why we define how we see allyship, right? This is why we explain what it means to be active or anti-racist, right? Accomplice is another great word and that, right, the connotations are important to pay attention to, right? You're still coming alongside someone, you're still helping to move forward, you're enacting maybe solidarity. So to keep it brief, I think, um, just really understand like what a word means, what are the different nuances behind them? And it doesn't matter what it's called at the end of the day is, are you still showing up? Are you still utilizing your voice? Are you still advocating, right? Are you still trying to choose to understand how someone else's like walk through life is different and still valid? If you're still doing the action behind what the word or the term encompasses, that is what matters and it doesn't necessarily matter as much what it's called as long as you're showing up awesome so one more question from your interactions with the corporate sector or organizations what are the barriers that they have encountered in trying to implement or establish social justice programs in the workplace what has been your recommendation so i work in the corporate um, sector and then we get to speak with um 
organization. So I think I can speak to a little bit of both. Some of the barriers is making sure that one, it's not just a checkbox um, implementation. You don't just set up a council or committee or set up these guidelines and then don't actually set tangible KPIs to get you to the goal that you're trying to achieve. And that's obviously easier said than done, right? There's been so many conversations around don't just, you know, do it or just don't just say it, but actually do it. But just as much as we approach wanting to make money in a business, right? Wanting to capture a new audience, wanting to X, Y, and Z, that same energy and that same mindful thinking about how we are implementing that needs to be applied when we're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it needs to be looking at representation at, um, you know, how are you moving people up in a company? How are you facilitating inclusive environments and so on? So I would say those are some of the biggest barriers is just making sure it's more than just talk at face value, right? And that you're really digging in and changing the systems and structures that are in place to how a company or organization functions to be able to execute accordingly. And I have two things on that too, because I've gotten the unique perspective of also getting to watch Brie in her company with this. And as we've talked to different groups, it seems like to me that most people have a pretty good understanding uh, or shared vocabulary of what diversity and equity mean. Equity, a little more issues with the pipeline of like, how do we get folks to the table? How do we reach groups we have historically never reached or even considered a viable talent pool? How do we change that? But I think the most challenge comes around that inclusion piece, which is when you get people to the table, are they comfortable? Are they, are you creating an environment for them to thrive, for them to give all of their gifts and talents in service of the company? Or have you just brought them to the table and then kept all the other things that make them feel uncomfortable or unsafe or on edge in place so that ultimately they still get weeded out because it's not a, it's not an ideal environment for them. And that has a lot do a lot with culture. Um, some of the culture things can be top down from a company, but often it's how do you shift your workforce's mindset and perspective that this conversation matters. And this isn't just like something we're doing to check a box. Like this is a deal breaker for us as a company. And if you're not going to be in the game, if you're going to be on the sidelines, then that's a deal breaker for us to work with you. Um, so I think that's one thing is around the inclusion. And then the other thing is, I think a lot of companies are approaching DE&I work kind of like we approach any other training, either that's like around sexual harassment or just uh, other principles that are specific to certain industries. And that's as an added thing on top of people's already very full plates at the workplace. And that really irks me because that's not sustainable. Read any good habit book or watch any TED talk about how do you build a good new habit. And they all emphasize you have to incorporate it or infuse it into your normal human behaviors or your current routines. Because it's got to be those small little nudges that over time your consistency pays off but not the big fancy, we have a $500 million fund for DE&I work, or we have now included this new important word into our governing documents or into our mission statement as a company. I feel that sometimes, I love the intention, love the intention, I'm here for that, but the execution happens in infusing that into the company's culture, the company's workflow, or the entity. You you could substitute company for school, classroom, social group, social media, whatever you want. But if you don't make it a part of the normal behaviors, the normal routines, where it is something you do your weekly debrief as a team, you also check in with your team on, hey, where are you at personally on growing in this area? Or it truly, as a leader, can your employees come to you and say, like, hey, I had this experience and you're not going to say, well, just because I didn't have that experience, I don't think it happened. So for me, I think those are two biggest stumbling blocks is the inclusion piece of making the people you bring to the table feel comfortable and making sure that the changes you're making aren't just an extra burden, an extra thing to do for your employees or your company, but it's actually something that they can weave into their practice and their perspective and the way they talk to clients, the way they find customers, the way they send their message on social media. It's got to be an element and throughout all of that. But great question and something that we're we're seeing play out live as the private sector and the public (laughs) sector figure out, hey, how do we actually deliver on all these promises we have not made? 
Exactly. So thank you for submitting questions. Again, like we said, we'll have another um, section at the end. So as Autumn brings this back up, please at any point still drop in your questions into the Q&A section. I've also seen one come through the chat. Either way, we'll make sure that we can hopefully capture all of those at the end. So now we are going to go into our workshop piece and we want to guide you and how do you create a plan to keep doing that learning and building. So if you're familiar with Justice in June, you know that it's a 30 day plan that started in June. Maybe you even did the July version, right? You have a daily piece um, of content that you dive into that fits within that time frame. some questions to help guide that as well as some resources to go on and continue to act. So in the chat, you should see two links action-oriented template and an education-oriented template. And we're gonna walk you through those. So you should be able to access via Google Drive and you will see it as a viewer and you can copy, make a copy so that you can edit and you'll be able to fill in. So we are gonna walk you through all of these. And then again, as we're going through, since we do want this to be interactive, feel free to ask any questions um, about the specific toolkit. So yes, again, we did kind of, Bree's gonna give an overview of this and we will break down this slide on separate slides. So please don't be overwhelmed by it, but we wanna give you kind of the big picture of, we're gonna go through step one, step two, step three. So picking your topic, finding some resources, finding the consumables, and then implementation of like, how are we gonna make this? Again, infuse this into our behaviors, not add this on top of what you already need to do in your busy lives. Um, so again, the links in the chat, Bree is posting there shortly. One is education oriented. So. That isn't to say you can't do any action, but we wanted to kind of specify, hey, this is one, this is a template for folks that are trying to just do more unlearning and learning and repeat that cycle. And then we do have an action oriented one, um, which is a template to start getting you thinking on how can I, maybe you're further along in your allyship journey. You were, when we did that temperature check, you were all the way on that green side. So we want you to start thinking about how are you showing up? How are you becoming an advocate or like that Q&A, an accomplice as part of the solution? And so then that's that what that link is. You're welcome to open both. You'll have access to both. Um, but just there's a distinction between the two. And we're going to walk through each briefly. But again, part of a workshop is for you to do some work and workshop it with us. So it'll be on you to start filling some of this. And we don't have time to go through every single resource you could utilize, but we will make sure to send a follow-up email with our slide deck and resources we recommend to pull from. Um, but kind of the, the world's your, no, how does it go? World's your oyster or there's something with a pearl. So you're going to be exploring using Google as well to find resources or things you've saved or bookmarked forever and haven't actually gone to reading or listening or watching at myself. This is a great time to plug and chug, put those into your structure. So those links are in there. Perfect. And again, kind of step one for either thing though, uh, this is super useful and one of the most help, this is just a teaching hack. If you can get students to come to their own realization about said foundational piece of knowledge or said topic or perspective, that's the big win. Because when you realize something for you, you're gonna remember it and it feels authentic and meaningful and genuine. If you hear someone kind of telling you like, ah, you need to do this, you need to believe this, this is how it is. It's just, it's just less. Your brain maps that differently. So something we recommend as a great starting point, not anything you have to do, but there is the implicit association test um, from Harvard's Project Implicit. And there is on the screen, you see a couple of the implicit association tests listed, race, skin tone, religion, weight, um, the Asian ethnicity, age, gender, career, Arab, Muslim, sexuality, gender science, all of these different areas that you can generally think polarized people or reading any of those, hearing me say any of those out loud, you might immediately have had a reaction to one. You can pick any of those as your topic. Again, this allyship isn't limited to specifically racial justice. You could think about allyship if you're interested in exploring LGBTQ or transgender or any of those areas or identities that you might not personally hold, but want to show up for you're welcome to. So we wanted to list a couple and kind of give you a thought starter on this implicit association test will objectively take you through questions where you just give your honest response. And then at the end, it will give you a score showing you like, hey, you might have a little bit of bias or prejudice on whatever thing you're taking the test for. 
So very handy tool, not something we want to guilt or shame you with, but something we want to use to empower you of like, ha, I'm by golly, I'm going to improve this score. Or if you're a kind of data nerd numbers person like me, I like to have a concrete something to move beyond. And ideally you won't move backwards, <laughs> but you should be able to see some progress from there. So we'd recommend starting with that. And that's also something we have at the top of both templates is to put your starting score and your ending score. And as a brief overview, Brie, I'm gonna just touch on the template organization real quick before we kind of go through the slides. But both look very similar. We called it Make Your March. Um, there's the education oriented one, then there's the action oriented one. At the very top of each, there's kind of an area on the left to pick a topic so that you can write out the thing you're gonna be diving into. And then also for this implicit association test score, if that's something that floats your boat and you wanna include, uh, like all power to you, go ahead and go for that. You do not have to. And then each week looks very similar, but there's three weeks. So we thought you could start this after this de &I week with USC um, because you're gonna have a lot more resources that I'm sure other sessions will go over and other things you might wanna bring into your three week plan. And then we did set it up so you would start a week from today and work through this and it would go over into the first few days of April, but it's the last three weeks of March. And then um, it's set up for you to ideally pick some resource for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then the weekend, you can treat as a weekend. You can maybe watch a documentary, do something longer form. Um, but we left that one more flexible. So we really want you to focus on having three weeks, five days each of content that you're exploring. Awesome. So diving into the steps that you're following along. So first off, Pick a topic. Where do you feel you want to dive in deeper? Maybe understand better. So we'll use the example, right? Maybe it's diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, right? These are some areas of maybe some buzzword topics that you could, subtopics or focus areas that you could look into. Maybe you are a higher level in your company and leadership, founded your own company, and you want to see what's the best practices to creating a council or a committee that is dedicated to this. There's a lot of information around there of how this should didn't just fall on the backs of those that are a minority group, right? Now, this shouldn't be extra on top work that people are not compensated for, right? Or it's not incorporated into how they're doing their day-to-day -day work as well, right? So that's one focus area. Maybe it's in recruitment and talent, right? Like how do you even get in front of more diverse audiences to recruit into your company or your organization? There's definitely been dialogue around right and harmful somewhat of oh it's just not there which is untrue right there's so many different outlets and resources and also companies and startups that have been focused around talent that is, falls into a specific group so that's another focus area that you could be on or ascension in a company right how do you get someone in the door right like autumn said at the table but how are you getting them to go up the stairs up the elevator and getting into these higher positions and not just at the entry level and then sponsorship versus mentorship right what does it look like to be able to help build someone in their professional success, but also are you advocating for them in another way, right? Are you being able, if you're looking at mentoring someone or sponsoring someone right inside your own company, which a lot of companies have these programs for interns, right? For entry levels, right? Are you also advocating for them in the areas in which they can continue to succeed? So those are just some focus areas to think about as well under the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Right. Or again, any of the different topics with the implicit association test does not have to be specifically around racial justice, but there are many topics there. School to prison pipeline, defund the police, um, the equity in housing, lots of gerrymandering, just equity in voting, lots of interesting subtopics that you could certainly dive into and get a decent handle on um, or learn something new in those three weeks. So we would like you to go ahead and put that into, hopefully you've made your copies now of whichever template you want to use. You're also welcome to not use a template. You can steal what you like. You can leave what you don't like. We want to just give you a visualization of like, oh, this is how I could start arranging things or doing learning for myself. Um, so go ahead and plug that topic in under, underneath allyship topic. And remember, you can keep this going, right? You say, March, I'm going to focus on this, this focus topic. April, I'm going to go into this and maybe I'm going to approach it differently. But first step, you want to make sure that to make it as tangible as possible, just really focus in. And just as in June, as well as our refresh content, which I will drop into the chat after we 
go do this. That's a great overview just to think differently about how systemic racism perpetuates our society as well as how do we approach allyship. But as you start to build and you get more of that general foundation, this is a great way to dive into specific topics. Right. Or even like the the buzzwords or cliches we kind of hear like microaggressions or model minority or understanding those different things, anti-Semitism, like understanding all of that would fall into a topic you could pinpoint and try to dive into. And then you probably realize as you dive into something like, oh, wow, there's still nuance in this. So you could even do a deeper dive into something there. And that's what's exciting. That's what's wonderful about the learning process and becoming a less ignorant human. You realize how much you don't know. So step two, finding the resources. This is something, so to be completely honest, when I was initially going through the 30 day template for June, I very arbitrarily was like, okay, here's two different aggregate resources that I've seen shared by lots of different people. I'm just going to start there and look at those. So it was a very arbitrary decision. There is no perfect way of choosing a resource. There will be a few pieces of advice. One piece of advice is as your work, is it only shared by people who wear all your same identities, look like you, talk like you, grew up like you? If it's only being shared by those folks or it's only being circulated by those folks, I would caution you which it might not be the case, but I would caution you that that is something that makes them feel comfortable. It didn't challenge ideas too much. And it was very easy to embrace. When you feel the tension, when you feel conflicted by a piece, when a title even sets you off, might be an interesting place to start. Might be an interesting resource to include. Um, as one of our favorite sermons or podcasters, Brie and I listen to, time under tension is growth. So you got to have that tension. You got to have this like, feeling of, oh, I'm like trying to figure this out or I'm convicted or I don't like this. This was challenging for me to work through. It's probably going to lead to a more fruitful end result for you than reading things that are easy to consume, already confirm what you believe, or maybe you're just like, oh, cool. I do that. Or like, I didn't challenge my perspective too much. So that's what I would recommend kind of when finding this content. Um, and then again, who is it coming from? Are you following the Instagram accounts of black activists, scholars, authors, people who've been working in this space who are like, hey, we really like this book, or hey, this is something that was authored from within the community that goes over X, Y, and Z. Those are the works you really wanna be pulling from because that, those are the experts in this, um, in this space. Or again, any identity you're, you're trying to dive into, look at the books that come from within the community, the podcasts that are interviewing people within the community the articles written interviewing the other people who are within the community. Again, that's kind of the key idea here is making sure where you're sourcing your material is not from folks that look, think, act, grew up like you. Right. So looking at the spread, this is where you're going to input your resources into that first line, right? So how are you activating today, right? So in the next step, we'll see how you can implement this, but let's say you want some articles, right? So for Monday, I'm going to read this article. For Tuesday, I'm going to watch this 10-minute podcast. For Wednesday, I'm going to read this chapter in this book, so on and so forth, right? So that's where you want to input your tangible piece that you're going to focus on. And then we just added some other pieces where you can kind of break it down a bit more, right? Your accountability plan, some questions, challenges, so that you can kind of monitor, okay, I went through this piece of content. Now let me take five, 10 minutes and just reflect on it, right? What are some thoughts that I'm feeling? What are some maybe more questions that I have that maybe now I can go search to dive in deeper? Yeah, and again, I would encourage you, like even I'm such a perfectionist sometimes, like I have this, I use, I'm a big Notion fan, I use Notion now, I have a daily journal template. And some days I'm like, oh, I can't journal because I don't have time before I go to bed to fill in all the things that I put into my beautiful aesthetic journal template. I would rather you do one part of this or read half the article or listen to two minutes of the podcast than do nothing. Because doing something is still the little micro win, the small W of getting you into a habit or pushing you towards being part of that solution. So even if you don't want to fill out the reflection questions or you don't want to have an accountability plan in place, I would encourage you to, at the bare minimum, just try to do a little bit of whatever you're outlining. Um, because something is definitely better than doing nothing and keeping on with the status quo. All right. So last step is implementation. So like we kind of mentioned earlier, right, do what you already know, incorporate it into already existing, existing practices, habits, lifestyles. So here's a few examples and there's so many more, but just some to think about, right? Social media. Let's say that, you know, you spend a good amount of time on Instagram. 
or communicating on Facebook, right? Maybe you substitute even 15 minutes of that time to read an online article, right? Maybe that's a great way for you to scroll through um, and just take in something new. You're adjusting an already existing practice. Daily reading. So for me, I want to keep reading more and maybe that's okay, 20 to 30 minutes every night or three days out of the week, I'm going to keep reading on the on the book that I started on. So substitute maybe, okay, I've just finished this, you know, fiction book, I'm going to substitute the next book with your new material. Um, maybe you like to listen to podcasts during your downtime or something I like to do is during work, if I'm doing a more kind of tedious or soup or a task that doesn't require me to be constantly communicating with someone, I'll play a pad- podcast in on the background. So I can now substitute that with a newer material or a piece of, um, you know, audio that is around this said topic, or let's say you have tutorials for your hobby. So I love to watch cooking videos, right. Or I like to see, you know, some, whatever hobby it is, maybe I can watch a Ted talk instead right or some type of video content Uh, even on instagram there's a lot of great little snippets that accounts have now that you have igtv you have reels all of these things right so just think about what is a normal practice that i do or maybe i'm setting a new goal and i can start by implementing something that is already part of my lifestyle and another note for me that i found what really helps is that infusion exactly And something I like to call like the in-between moment. So whatever you have on your calendar, the in-between of those blocked out meetings or this event or this outing, those in-between moments are so valuable. And so many of us don't utilize them or optimize them. So when I'm doing dishes recently, I've been watching master classes. So every once in a while I switch in or substitute. Oh, cool. I'm going to watch this podcast. I'm going to watch this daily show episode, or I'm going to watch this interview that I know is going over this thing that I want to understand. So I switch that into when I'm doing dishes, which is something I already have to do. When I do laundry, throw on a podcast when I'm in the car commuting, also do a podcast. Um, when I'm brushing my teeth, even like I have all these things I ritualize just for fun because I like to make my life entertaining, even the mundane stuff I have fun doing. So find areas. I don't want I don't want you to think about this step as like, oh, shoot, I don't actually know if I have time to add on to my schedule. The goal here is to get creative with where you have existing time in your schedule that you're doing something else and you could pair these two. So it could be a learning as you do something else or as you eat lunch or you're going to FaceTime a friend on Fridays during your lunch because you're both going to commit to watching or listening to a podcast during your lunch the other four days. And then you're both going to discuss it on Fridays. So find things that you already do those and ritualize them or things you've already ritualized and then add on these elements or add in, not add on, add in these elements of learning and unlearning. Perfect. So best practices to think about. First of all, set smart goals, right? Making sure that it's actually achievable, right? You put time parameters around it. You can measure it, right? If you say you're going to finish a book within a month, pace it out, right? Don't just say, okay, a month. I'm going to read this much each week, right? Give yourself grace. It is not going to be perfect all the time, every time. But if you make sure that you're giving yourself room for growth, right, to fall or fail forward, it's going to feel less of something that you have to do or check off just because and something that you can learn about, you know, how you best function when you're building this out. Also find accountability. So like I said, Autumn is my accountability partner. We learn about new things all the time, or maybe someone asks a question or mentions something. We have great people also that we use as checks and balances so we can get outside of our own mindset. That is a way that we can learn to grow or maybe, oh, maybe how we use certain language around something, right? So find that accountability, whether it's a person, right, as a partner, or even if you're super active in social media, right, and you love to share new content, share about your journey, share about your experience. You find a really great infographic graphic rooted in what you learn from it. Pace yourself, right? Don't try to gobble everything up. Really make sure that you're bringing in and and set rooting in that soil what you're learning internalizing some of the things that you're reading and listening to and as always celebrate the small wins Mm. micro steps micro progress is what you need to be looking at we just don't change the world overnight right but we talk about moment to movement take each of those moments and then next thing you know you look back on the path and you're already halfway there 
right? So make sure you're celebrating your achievements and your milestones and then using that to propel you forward. Definitely. And kind of just as some closing, we have a few closing things and then we will get back to Q&A because I know we are coming up on our time here. So we'd love to get your responses now, hopefully, of you feeling more comfortable with activating your allyship or at least having a more tangible, clear idea of what that means and can look like. Um, and again, we are going to send, we can, or I, I think we can do this. I have not found out for sure, but we will ask our moderators later if we can send a follow-up email with, again, some more of our recommendations for where you could pull resources from and the slide deck too, if you want to kind of walk through it again. Um, we're more than happy to share that. You can always reach back out to us as well. And let's do this one last time. Yay, we have more. This is what you want as a teacher. You want to see that more people feel comfortable or at least have progressed in the time that's always exciting so thank you i feel very uh i don't know what the word is i'm looking for validated i guess i suppose as a teacher awesome. and of course stay connected any of these will have you know our contact info is out there we're on all or most social medias um you can also follow our personal accounts and our email is probably the best way to get in contact with both of us just as in june official at gmail.com and we're happy to do future, future, oh my gosh, words are hard, future conversations. If you'd like to have a session or tailor your session um, in the future with a different group or different organization, we're more than happy to chat about that. So again, just as in June official at gmail.com, probably the best way to get in contact with us, but you're more than welcome to reach out to us on any of those other social medias. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I'll leave this slide up on your Pear Decks on your secondary devices. But I know there were some other really good questions in the Q&A. Uh, so we're going to get yes. to those. Awesome. So we're going to do rapid fire. We're going to try to keep our answers super short. But again, you can reach out to us if you have any other follow-ups. Uh, this is a great one. Have you, have either of you been in a, have either of you been in a difficult DEI situation that you diffused? Personally, yes. And, um, I think what I have been learning, especially very recently from some intellects that have been giving, uh, have great advice in their podcast is first take it at face value and then recognize what are you going to get out of the situation? Does creating a bigger problem only create more of a problem for yourself or is it going to lead to actual resolution? Is the path solution oriented? Um, I would say part of being in a corporate environment is that it takes a little bit to shift the cogs and the systems and structures that are already in place to figure out how can we execute this better and everyone needs to care and needs to be a champion of it it shouldn't just be the people that it affects the most so that has sometimes been challenging but what I've learned is that I still, at the end of the day, have a job to get done. I have places and people to show up for. So I'm not going to let that affect my mental well-being if it's not leading towards a solution. So that's the, the cookie cutter somewhat answer. Um, but really just at the end of the day, if you're in a situation that's a bit more challenging or difficult, just think, what is the outcome? What is the resolution? Is there someone that's safe that you can talk to that maybe you don't work with directly or isn't your reporting manager or superior where you can say you can just get it out and off your chest in a professional manner so that you can keep going on and doing what you need to do. Great. All right. All right next I can read off this next one. Have you had better luck reaching out to and educating individuals or strangers over a physical conversation or through virtual mediums like texting, phone calls, social media? And then would you recommend one or the other considering um, just different ages, generations? and how communication varies from culture to culture, individuals to individuals. Um, I would say, I don't know, I can start this one off, but I would say predominantly our main conversations have happened through as in person, uh, a conversation as you can have through Zoom or virtual mediums. We actually, we haven't, I can say this with full certainty, we have not physically attended any place because of the pandemic to speak or to engage in conversation as an entity, Justice in June. Individually, we have in our own workspaces. Um, so when those conversations come up, then I would be in person at work. But I think in general, most people have adjusted to working virtually or at least having, trying to have genuine connection through virtual mediums. So I'd say we've had pretty decent success with that. And also just 
people asking questions, showing up, being vulnerable, and like us having this dialogue, like we're having right now, is has been very fruitful. And also, I guess to use the cliche, um, you get in what you put, you get out what you put in. So the more people have invested or asked genuine questions or listened or took notes or whatever they've done during the virtual conversations, I think that's been more fruitful for folks because they've had that engagement. So. I say with a pandemic, it's been more fruitful virtually because that's been our only option. <laughs> right. And to add to that, when you're thinking about texting and phone calls, right? Remember how things can sometimes get lost in translation. So just be cognizant of that and know that, what again, what is your end goal with having that conversation? Do you think that your point is going to get cro- across better in a different form than set up that time, right? Or set up that time where you're focusing on whatever you want to talk about? Great question. Um, so the next one, I just learned about the concept of performative allyship. Can you speak to the idea of how to self check that any action you are considering is likely to be helpful? This is great. I will take this and I'll throw it to autumn. We do touch on this because, and for anyone who's unfamiliar, performative allyship is the fact that is that checkboxing is where maybe you're, um, predominantly in social media, posting something or kind of somewhat virtue signaling of here's the information or here's the piece, here's, you know, oh, this is how I feel. And then it stops there. You're not actually continuing to do the work, having the conversations, internal dialogue, right? Or, or supporting the organizations and causings that are doing the work. Two points I'll make. One, at the end of the day, it still serves somewhat of a purpose because even if one person's idea is challenged because of it and if they're interacting with you because of a similar lived experience or or interaction or relationship dynamic, right? And they're like, okay, I can relate to this person on some level. They're posting about this. This is interesting. Maybe it challenges how I'm thinking about it. It's worth it. The second part is bringing in that accountability and also understanding that what you see isn't always what is happening. Um, So one example of performative allyship that we saw, I would say very early on in the movement is the posting of the black square. That was a very, it kind of shifted um, the solution oriented piece of the movement because a lot of people were just posting black square and then moving on with their life, right? But it's, what are you doing on the end? Bringing transparency to where you're at, right? Acknowledging that I don't know even where to start, or maybe, but I can recognize that something is wrong, or I can recognize that there's a disparity, and I'm at least going to attempt to do the work. And I am comfortable with having criticism. Not everyone is going to give you their feedback in a sugar-coated, peachy keen way, right? And being open to that and and understanding that no matter how it comes to you, it's hopefully not meant to harm you. It's it's meant to help you and to progress you. So definitely how you check if you're doing performative allyship is, is there still, um, you know, action behind it? And then I think Autumn can also talk, speak to how do you bring someone into that? Yeah, I think for me, the thing that gave me the most cathartic release of being really annoyed because mm, hypocrisy just grinds my gears. I very much dislike seeing folks say like talk the talk and then not walk the walk. So I feel you on this. I just really, that irks me as well. Um, first I recognize that I fall into it sometimes because it's very hard to show up in all of my spaces, um, as woke as possible for everything that an ally can show up for. So sometimes I, I, I deal with figuring out where is my personal line, but a way to, a really easy way, I think to kind of throw that check at someone else in a kind reminder way is just ask them like, Hey, um, I see that you're doing this. Like I want someone to help hold me accountable. So you kind of make yourself the one looking for help, even though you really know you're kind of trying to pull them in to a good space. And by asking them like, Hey, I want someone to hold me accountable. I noticed that you posted or said, or did X, Y, Z. Um, I'd love to hop on the phone. I'd love to join you in this. I'm reading this next chapter of the book you posted. Like, let's talk about it. So try to encourage their engagement or act accountability by being that partner, being that buddy. Um, and that could be, and then if they don't follow up or at least hopefully they, they've paused for a second to think like, Hmm, I posted this, I said this, I did this, but was that really me, you know, getting involved in the space and showing up versus just saying that I'm showing up. Right. So yeah, I always throw a bone and try to try to truly get them because we want the outcome. We want the outcome of that. We want 
the needle being nudged. And so there's other ways you can kind of encourage them kindly to nudge that needle. Otherwise, again, what type of soil are you dealing with? Don't waste your own mental energy and time on someone who isn't going to be super fruitful when you could be spending that somewhere else. Right. So last two questions before we wrap. How do you suggest talking about police reform slash the defund the police issue? I find that otherwise progressive people have negative reactions to that topic. So this is super nuanced. Um, We had to go through figuring out how do you really kind of develop and play in this space. One, recognizing that language and rhetoric is important and that for some people, just hearing defund the police is going to get an immediate visceral reaction. Now, what you have to go in with the mindset of, are we both working from the same level of understanding? I understand the full um, concept of what it means around the topic of defunding the police. But if you're talking to someone that is going off of a different basis, you all might be going back and forth and not get to a, a surface level understanding because you're going off of different definitions or conceptual understanding of the topic. So I would say, ask those questions of how do you see police reform? What do you, what do you envision when we talk about that? What are you understanding as the concept of defund the police, right? Start there, ask those questions and then have the conversations of this is how I see it. This is how I see it being enacted on certain levels. This is the types of conversations that we need to even be having so that we can move forward And I think also understanding that, right, like everything is nuanced and multifaceted. Someone may be progressive and not understand this concept or have different um, relations to it because of their own personal experience. And that personal experience informs how someone is going to receive that. So it's very tricky, but I would definitely say start with, can we come to a basis level of understanding? If we can do that, then we can then share our own perceptions of it and how we view it and then get to the next level of exchanging of ideas and breaking down that concept. Yeah. And this one is particularly challenging. And there are, I think there's a lot of merit because I have seen schools of thought around, well, we don't need to change our language just so someone feels comfortable. And I'm like, ah, I can see that. I can understand where I was coming from, but I am so outcome driven that I don't necessarily care about the means to get somewhere. I'm like, I just don't want people to die. Like, I just don't want senseless, innocent death. So I kind of come from, and I actually have had several teachers at my school who are are married into law enforcement. My white half of the family has law enforcement in it. So it's not that this is something I'm completely removed from. And I know the risk they take every day going out to do their jobs. Um, So it's very hard too. It's a tricky issue. Like, especially in my family of just like some of us have very different experiences with the police than the people who I love dearly, who are the police. Um, So I think for me, one thing was just, hey, are you on the team of let's reduce senseless, innocent death on both sides, but just in general of citizens lives and of people's lives. And it's very hard to refute that and be like, no, I'm here for more people dying. Like you can usually all get get a quick way and I'm like, cool, we're on the same side there. Um, Another thing that I've just found interesting, again, leading people to have self-discovery, self-realization realizing how much of city budgets are spent on law enforcement is a bit eye-opening. We're like, that's your tax dollars being allocated in such a way. And it's not to say we don't want, uh, we want anarchy and we want lawlessness. Law, lawlessness is to say like, hey, currently what we've got going on is still a problem. We all, I think it's pretty easy for most people to say like, what is existing has problems. So we need to try something new. And then I think it's easy to say, like, where are quick wins? How can we do quick changes? So getting them to realize, like, whoa, I didn't realize that when I'm paying my city tax or my state tax, that much of it is going to this one entity. And then the next thing that I found really helpful, too, is using examples or case studies of things that can work. So there are cities and towns and law enforcement agencies that have adopted um, vastly different police policies or policing like protocols than what we kind of know um, or, or see as like the status quo right now. And those have had success. So I think it's important to just show like there can be a win. I think a lot of people get worried by the unknown or like, oh my gosh, I don't know what a world could look like where that's different. And if you can show them 
what a world can look like where that's different because it exists right now, but in bubbles versus around or like across the U.S., then I think there is a level of comfort or familiarity even that comes um, with being able to say like, oh, okay, I feel a little more relaxed seeing that, that can't, the change you're suggesting can work. So again, like Bree said, a lot of complexity, a lot of nuance, and a lot of people that have had, that have people they dearly love um, that are in law enforcement and then also have parts of their family that experience the short end of the stick or quite literally lose their lives to law enforcement. Right. So before our last question, question really quick on that, if you go to my account at BRYBRY1217, we did a series of hot takes with Autumn and Brie, and we discussed the concept of defund the police. So just go to the IGTV section, and that's a great way to maybe dive in, see some of the questions that we answered around that, and hopefully it's easy to share as well. Um, and maybe that will break it down a little bit for you. Last question. What do you or other people you know look for in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace? So I'll keep this super short. Three things. One, is it tangible and is it measurable and is it being implemented in an action-oriented way? So if there's, this can be executed in so many different ways, right? It can be a council and committee. It can be a changing in systems and structures. It can be the relationship with HR, right? Is it being put as just, here's this checkbox, or is it being implemented where if I go back six months or a year, right, or go forward, right, six months or a year from now, do I have a way to measure it so I can look back and see if we actually hit that KPI? Um, second, how is an inclusive environment being fostered, right? Is it the language that we're thinking about? Is it recognizing different lived experiences and identities that show up to the workplace and that because uh, the personal informs how sometimes we show up in the professional that we're acknowledging when someone might not be able to show up 100% for that day? Are we making the space that someone even feels comfortable or confident to share where they're at or where they might need some more resources? And lastly, Equity really means looking at the system and structure and how we are adjusting it for the people that might be falling through the cracks, right? Equality is that we're all in the same field, but sometimes that field is uneven to begin with. So how equity is taking it and restructuring it. So we're at that same baseline, which means someone else, someone might get two boxes over here to see over the fence or someone gets one while well, someone is already at the height that they need to, to be to see over the fence, right? That's a quick, just visual way of thinking about it. So those are the things that I kind of look for in the workplace and being able, is leadership being held accountable, right? Is leadership at the top also fostering this as well as those going from bottom up? All right. And again, if you have any other questions or comments or anything comes up later in your lives, we'd love to get stay in touch with you or get in touch with you. So um, on that Paradox slide on your secondary device, our contact is still up there and we will reach out after the session as well. So we're happy to take any other conversations offline. But yes, but thank, thank you, you so much for having us.